Lord this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Put your hands together.
may be seated. Turn your attention to the screens. Good morning, church family and guests, and welcome to Sneeds Assembly of God. Here are your video announcements for Sunday, September 1st, 2024. Come join us for midweek services this coming Wednesday, September 4th. Family supper will begin at 5.30 p.m. Prayer time will be in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Bible study, one-way student ministries, and kids' connections all begin at 6.30 p.m. The menu for family supper will be hamburgers, french fries, and baked beans. So stop by and grab a bite before service. Attention Sneeds Assembly of God men. On Thursday, September 5th, we'll be feeding the Sneeds JV football team here at the church at 3 p.m. Please come out and join us as we pour into the lives of these special young men. Go Pirates! On Sunday, September 15th, we will be doing a water baptism service. If you are interested in being water baptized, please see Pastor Bill. From everyone at Sneeds Assembly of God, we hope you all have a very safe and fun-filled Labor Day weekend. This concludes the video announcements for today. Thank you for joining us at Sneeds Assembly of God. We're so glad you're here. Thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, well, you survived yesterday and you're still pretty. Some of, you, some of you survived Thursday, and some of us survived yesterday, and some of us just need Jesus that root for anybody else. Amen? Well, I've got that out of the way. So thank you. Good to see each of you in the house of the Lord this morning. God bless you. Thank you for gathering in on this Labor Day weekend. We have a number of people that are out today due to sickness. We've got a lot of people that are traveling on the road. And, uh, but we're glad you're here, and uh, we're thankful that you chose to come and worship with us today at Sneed's Assembly. We do want to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, Brother Raymond Holloway is in Jackson Hospital. He's been having trouble breathing. Uh, they have ruled out flu. They've ruled out uh, COVID, pneumonia, and all of that. So he told me this morning, he said, y'all don't be scared to come see me. I ain't, I ain't got none of that junk. <laughs> So um, he was in good spirits this morning, doing a lot better. He's kept Nancy and Greg on the run, and uh, they're doing good too. They need more prayer than Brother Raymond do, I believe. <laughs> Amanda Finch, this is Sister Jenna's uh, sister-in-law, 33 years old, had a stroke on Monday, and she is in Tallahassee Memorial Hospital with complications. So we want to remember uh, Amanda this morning. Aggie Wise, this is Serena Wise, his grandmother's in Flowers Hospital. She needs a touch from the Lord. Brenda Thursby is Sister Corrine Finch's sister in TMH, is diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, and she just has a lot of issues that are going on that we need to pray for. Jimmy Devane did come home from the hospital, but he still needs a divine healing. James Perdue is recovering from a broken leg, so let's continue to remember him. Brother Henry Dix Dixon has been sick over the last week and needs a touch from the Lord. Alexa Sheffield, we've been asked to pray for her. Judy Henson, uh, let's continue to lift her up. Sister Betty Weeks did come home from the hospital, but she uh, still has a long way to go, so let's remember her in our prayers as well. Uh, Reverend Francis Dudley, uh, she needs our prayers this morning. Aubrey Sheffield has asked us to pray for her, uh, for, pray for him. Uh, Sister Anita Coley is recovering from a broke hip, so let's remember her in our prayers. And then Jeff Russell will be having complete knee replacement September the 11th. And then we also want to pray for uh, Sister Emily Bamberg that God would continue to heal her. And we want to have special prayer for Hallie Prince this morning. Sister Hallie's family is with us today. Hallie will be, they will be leaving out tomorrow morning, is that correct, or this afternoon? Tuesday morning, all right. You're going to be leaving out Tuesday morning, but we want to have special prayer for her and anybody else in the house that just needs a special touch from God. We're going to ask you to come too. We're going to pray for you and ask the Lord to heal you. How many of you know God is a divine healer? You believe that this morning? I believe it with everything in me. I want you to stand across the house of the Lord. Sister Hallie, bring your family, anybody else that wants to come and receive prayer for physical healing. We want you to come this morning. We want to pray for you. Father, we love you and we thank you today for your mercy and your grace to us. We ask you, Lord, by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, God. 
that you would lay your hands upon these that are sick today, God, that you would heal their bodies. You would minister to them as only you can, Lord. We know that absolutely nothing is impossible for you, Lord. And so today, we believe, God, by the, by the power of Jesus Christ, that name which is above every name, we believe every stripe that was placed on your back, God, was for the healing of your saints. We ask you, God, in Jesus' name to touch those that are in the hospital, those that need a special touch from God. We ask you in the name of Jesus to minister to them. Heal cancers, Lord, we pray this morning. God, we pray for Sister Betty Weeks that you'd continue to heal her body from pneumonia. We pray for Amanda, Lord, that you would supernaturally raise her up from this stroke. God, she has five babies. We ask you, Lord, to minister to her as only you can. Help her, Lord. Heal her body, God, we pray. We speak Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over all of these needs. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you will, stretch your hands towards Sister Hallie, and let's pray today. God. Give your neighbor a high five. Come on, give him a high five. <laughs> yeah, you won't. <laughs> Lord, help me with these seniors. <laughs> Amen. Now, give you another, another, uh, your neighbor another high five. Say, you look better with your lip in rather than out. Amen. God bless you. Let's enjoy the service today.
just feel really impressed to tell somebody in this house, no matter what you're going through this morning, no matter what you're trying to fix, there's only one that can fix it, and his name is Jesus, and he's worthy of it all. Come on, I want you to slip your hands toward heaven all over this house. They're going to sing that chorus again. They're going to sing that chorus one more time. You are worthy of it all. And whatever you're going through, I want you to lay it at the throne of Jesus. I want you to lay it at his feet. And when you get done with this chorus, you're going to leave it right there at his feet because you can't fix it. Only God can fix it. Come on, sing it again, choir. Sing all over this house. He is worthy of it all. Come on, church, praise him this morning. He inhabits the praises of his people. You are worthy of it all. He's worth everything you're going through. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, blessed be your name, Jesus. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, he deserves the glory in this house. Come on, praise him, church. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Thank you for taking us out of the pit, out of the horrible clay. Thank you, Lord, for delivering us, God. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for healing. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you today, God. We bless you today, God. You're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy. You're worthy today, Lord. You are worthy today, God. We take time to bless you this morning, Jesus. Thank you for inhabiting the praises of your people. Thank you for your presence in this place today, God. Thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. You may be seated in the house of the Lord this morning if you can. Can we give all of our visitors a good hand this morning that are in the house of the Lord with us? Thank you, visitors, for coming. You've filled some of the gaps for those that are laying out. <laughs> And I'm sorry, that are on vacation. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I always celebrate when families get to get away and have vacation together. And how many of you know we need downtime? All of us need downtime. Speaking of which, I am so blessed today to have people in our lives and in our church who have the call of God upon their life, and, and uh, I can call upon them in my time of need as well and have some downtime. And so this morning, if, uh, if you would, I want you to help me to welcome to this pulpit our youth pastor, Miss Jenna Johnson. She's going to preach for us today. Come, sister. so honored to be able to preach for y'all this morning. As I was preparing for today, I was reflecting on my time here at Sneeds Assembly, and for the record, I have no plans to go anywhere. <laughs> you better not. <laughs> but I was thinking about my time under Pastor Johnny Ray in youth ministry, and uh, during that time, I studied how he delivered sermons, and he gave me insight into how he prepared them. I liked how he had introductions to his sermons, so much so that I ended up adopting that delivery style as well. You are experiencing such an introduction right now. <laughs> Ironically, Pastor Juno told me once that he didn't care for those introductions, and he would often think to himself, Johnny, get to the point. And I laughed when he told me that because I knew good and well that I do the same thing. And I wondered how many times had he thought to himself, Jenna, get to the point. <laughs> I studied Pastor Juno as well. I'd have been a fool not to. And from him, I've tried to emulate his precision and his passion. I fall short, of course, but man, it has been a blessing to be able to learn from him. And already, Pastor Bill has had an impact on my methods. I don't know if you've noticed, but Pastor Bill has the incredible ability to wait. 
The ability to wait is rare, especially in this day and age of immediate gratification, check, 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 move on. But Pastor Bill will patiently wait in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he's been leading us to do the same, and it has been a tremendous lesson and blessing for me, both as a congregant and as a pastor. So thank you for that, Pastor Bill. So I have been incredibly blessed to serve with three of the most impactful, passionate, anointed preachers that I know of. And as I was reflecting on that and what message to deliver today, I felt that I was led to the book of Ephesians for a message on unity that I've titled, Let's Walk Together. Let's Walk Together. One thing that I didn't pick up from another pastor is my desire to pray before reading the word. So please join me as I do that, and then we'll see what God has for us today. Father, we love you. We thank you today. We're so grateful to be able to gather together in your house this morning. Father, we're grateful to worship you, to get into your word today and grow. God, I ask you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be able to convey your word in an understandable and a meaningful way. I also ask that the people have ears to hear and hearts to understand and accept your word. Be in this service, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. We're going to be in the fourth chapter of Ephesians this morning. If you would, please turn there in your Bibles. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. The scripture will also be on the screens. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. If you found your place, please say amen. Amen. All right. Unity in the body of Christ. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Of course, the book of Ephesians was written by Paul as a letter to the people of Ephesus, It is said that Ephesians is one of the high points of God's revelation and teaching in the Bible. And it has a unique place among Paul's letters because it's not focused on spiritual problems, leadership issues, or controversy within the church as much of Peter's letters are. Instead, Ephesians reflects deep spiritual maturity, gratitude, and insight, which grows out of Paul's personal prayer life. We also know that Paul wrote this letter while in prison for spreading the message of Christ. The letter was delivered by Tychicus, although it's believed that Paul wrote Ephesians with a wider audience in mind than just the church of Ephesus, which works out rather well for us. Now, I don't have to tell you that the world is a mess, especially in an election year. We have all sorts of unpleasant things hurled at us. There is division, there is strife, there is anger, there are manufactured emergencies of varying levels, and it brings stress, it brings angst, it brings us down. But most importantly, if we let it, it tears us apart. 
I also don't have to tell you that here at Sneed's Assembly of God, here in our own little bubble, we've gone through a transition. Pastor Juno stepped down and Pastor Bill stepped up. And can I just insert here that I thank God for his provision and the wisdom of our leadership? But we were and arguably are vulnerable during this time of transition. We've heard stories of lesser things splitting a church down the middle. But I haven't seen that here. Can I tell you what I have seen? I've seen our volunteer base rise. I've seen us serving our community. I've seen unexpected salvations. I've seen people be reached through the divine workings of the Holy Spirit that previously were not even on our radar. I've seen growth. I've seen this church come together and thrive, and I've seen God use it. So my purpose today is threefold. First, I want to say that if you've been a part of what I'm talking about, I see you. You're not doing it for me. You're not doing it for Pastor Bill. I know that. But it's good to know that your efforts have been seen and appreciated. Second, if you haven't jumped in yet, then what are you waiting for? Let's go. (laughs) Yes. God is on the move, and it is an awesome privilege to experience it firsthand. Hopefully, today's message encourages you. And third, I want to share the wisdom that Paul wrote to the Ephesians on this very matter, on being unified. And just so that we're taking our scripture in context, I do want to point out that the first three chapters of Ephesians deal with doctrine, our riches in Christ, and the last three chapters explain our duty, our responsibility in Christ. Today, we're just going to be looking at one of those chapters, and the key word I want to draw your attention to is walk. In our passage of Scripture, Paul is telling us how to walk. If you were to continue to verse 17, he begins to tell us how not to walk, but we're going to save that for another day. The walk that Apostle Paul focuses on in chapter 4 is unity. Walking in unity, meaning walking together which is why I've titled this message, Let's Walk Together. So we're going to break our scripture passage down into four bite-sized pieces, if you will. We're going to start with verses 1 through 3. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're going to call this section the grace of unity. If we're going to maintain unity of the spirit, as Paul writes about, we must possess the Christian graces that are necessary. Paul lists them in this scripture passage. The first two are humility and gentleness. I recently read a quote that said, humility is the grace that when you know you have it, you've lost it. Humility means putting Christ first, others second, self last. Sometimes we fail to be humble. We think too highly of ourselves. But I think for Christians, it's also easy to fall into the trap of thinking too lowly of ourselves. Romans 12.3 tells us, For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So, of course, we shouldn't walk in arrogance, but we also have to remember that God created each of us on purpose for a purpose, for a God-ordained purpose. And if you let the enemy beat you down and begin to think of yourself as worthless, you will never walk in that purpose as God intended for you to. So, humility and gentleness, yes, but remember that meekness is not weakness. That's right. Meekness is power under control. Numbers 12.3 tells us that Moses was a meek man, and yet look at the tremendous power that he exercised. Matthew 11.29 tells us that Jesus himself was meek and lowly in heart, yet he drove demons from bodies and money changers from the temple. Be humble, but don't belittle yourself. Meekness is not weakness. Next, Paul mentions patience. This is the same as long-suffering, which literally means long-tempered, the ability to endure discomfort without fighting back. This leads to 
uh, bearing with one another in love or forbearance. This is a grace that cannot be experienced apart from love. It's no coincidence that these graces, as I'm calling them, align so well with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Because unity of the Spirit is the result of walking by the Spirit, as is written in Galatians. The next grace that Paul lists is eagerness. Your translation might list endeavor there. The verse reads, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. We have to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Think of a home, a Sunday school class, or a church. The spiritual unity of those places is the responsibility of each person there, and the responsibility never ends. We have a continuous role to play. The final grace listed is peace. In its entirety, verse 3 reads, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. James 3, 17 and 18 reads, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is is sown in peace by those who make peace. Again, peace is a fruit of the Spirit. War on the outside is a good indication of war on the inside. If a believer cannot get along with God, then he or she is not going to be able to get along with other believers. That's good. Finally, I want to add that unity is not uniformity. Mm. Unity is not uniformity. Unity comes from within and is a spiritual grace, while uniformity is the result of pressure from without. We can absolutely walk together in spiritual unity, pleasing to God, accomplishing his will, while using the giftings and ability that he gave us, which means we might all go about the task at hand a little differently. That's right. But as long as we're operating with the grace of unity, through humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, then we are in accordance with the Word, and I believe we will thrive as a church and make a monumental impact on our community. The second section of Scripture we're going to tackle are verses 4 through 6, and I'm I'm going to call this section the grounds of unity. Let's read those verses. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. That's our foundation. Unity built on anything other than biblical truth is a foundation not worth standing on. In this short section of scripture, Paul lists one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father are grounds of unity. Let's break them down. One body. This is the body of Christ in which each believer is a member placed there at conversion by the Holy Spirit. The one body is the model for many local bodies, which are churches that God has established across the world. And I'll say this too. The fact that a person is a member of the one body does not excuse them from belonging to a local body a local church, because it's there that he or she exercises their spiritual gifts and helps others to grow. God did not give you those gifts to hide away. Again, I'll say you were created on purpose for a purpose that furthers the kingdom of God. Stay connected to a local church and honor God with your purpose. It maintains spiritual unity. One spirit. The same Holy Spirit indwells in each believer and activates our fellowship, for some of us more than others. <laughs> Left to my own devices, you would never see me or hear from me. <laughs> I am horribly introverted. All I can make out of the fact that I'm standing here right now is that I certainly give God any and all glory that comes from it, and I believe he's even more glorified by calling the unlikely. If you know me well, then you know this is not my comfort zone. This is operating in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is necessary for our spiritual unity. Moving on in our scripture, we come to one hope of your calling. This refers to the return of the Lord to take his church to heaven. The Holy Spirit is within us and our assurance of the great promise found in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. 
In him you also, which you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Paul is suggesting here that the believer who realizes the existence of one body, who walks in the spirit, who's looking for the Lord's return, is going to be a peacemaker, right. not a troublemaker. That's right. Which again, maintains unity. One Lord. Essential to the Christian faith and unity is the confession that there is only one Lord. The fact that there is only one Lord means that Jesus' work of redemption, spiritual salvation, liberation from sin, and restoration of our relationship with God is perfect and sufficient. No other Savior or mediator is needed to bring us to God. Only Jesus provides the opportunity for spiritual salvation, and only through Christ can we come near to God. Amen. Or as we say it in youth, Jesus is the one way. Yes. One faith. This is the gospel. This is what all Christians agree on, even when there are disagreements elsewhere. One well, baptism, Paul's referring to the baptism of the Spirit. Yes. And last in our grounds of unity, one God and Father. Paul likes to emphasize God as Father, as do I. God is over all, working through all and in all. We are children in the same family, loving and serving the same Father. Yes. And in that, we walk together in unity. The Lord's Prayer opens with, Our Father, not my Father. Those are the grounds of unity. Let's move on to verses 7 through 11 for the gifts of unity. The scripture reads, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. We're cutting verse 11 off in the middle of the sentence, but we're going to pick it up in our last section. The gifts of unity listed are apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers. So Paul has moved on now from what all Christians have in common to how Christians differ from each other. He's discussing variety and individuality within the unity of the Spirit. According to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, God has given each believer at least one spiritual gift, and that gift is to be used for the unifying, the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. Right. There is a distinction between natural abilities and spiritual gifts. When you were born into the world, God gave you certain natural abilities, maybe in, I don't know, mechanics or art or athletics or music. There are countless examples. So we're not all the same. Some of us have abilities that others of us don't have. For example, I gave birth to children with musical abilities, but I don't have any musical abilities myself. It's not fair, if you ask me. <laughs> but our talents differ. And that's because we need different strengths and abilities to come together, to be stronger, to be more able together. If we all had the exact same abilities, it would be boring and nothing would get done. There are also spiritual gifts, as I said, which we all have. A spiritual gift is a God-given ability to serve God and other Christians in such a way that Christ is glorified and believers are edified. As I was researching this topic, I came across a question posed in a resource that asked, how does the believer discover and develop his gifts? And I laughed. Most of you know that the Fine Arts Festival through the Assemblies of God is a passion of mine. And this question that was asked is a primary reason why. Someone was really wondering, how? How can I discover and develop my gifts? And it's a legitimate question. The reason I laughed is because for years, the tagline for fine arts has been discover, develop, and deploy your ministry gifts. So when I read that question, I thought, man, why stop short at just discovering and developing? Come on to the Assemblies of God. We'll help you discover, develop, and then we'll deploy you. Praise God. <laughs> but to answer that question, for those of you who have outgrown youth group, first, I'm sorry, we can't take you to fine arts. But... The local assembly, the local church, is where you'll discover, develop, and deploy your spiritual gifts. Fellowship with other believers, 
especially mature Christians, and they will begin to see in you the gifts that God put there. And if you're willing, the church will begin to help you develop those gifts. And when you've done that, you'll be deployed to help edify other believers and to bring glory to God, and the cycle will continue. Which is another reason that Christians don't need to keep themselves in isolation from other believers. We are different members of the same body, and we need all of us to make the impact that God intended for us to make. Without any one of us present, we're missing hands and feet and elbows and knowledge and talent that all come together to further the kingdom of God. And we can try to plug other people into your spot. We do that all the time, but it will never be as effective as you being there because there's no better you than you. Turns out, God knew what he was doing. That's right. I'm going to get back on track. I'll talk about discovering, developing, and deploying all day. Okay, so Paul tells us that Christ is the giver of these gifts through the Holy Spirit. And he paints this picture in our scripture passage of Christ ascending to heaven as victor. This picture is of like a military conqueror leading his captives and sharing the spoil with his followers. But in this case, the captives are not the enemies, but believers. Sinners who were once taken captive by sin and Satan have now been taken captive by Christ. Even death itself was defeated. When he came to earth, Christ experienced the depths of humiliation. But when he ascended to heaven, he experienced the highest exaltation possible. Verse 8 is Paul reciting Psalm 68, 18, which was a victory song written by David. Now, there are three lists of spiritual gifts given in the New Testament, and the lists are not identical, so it may be that Paul didn't name every gift available. We do know that all believers are needed if the body is going to function as God intended. And as we move down through the scripture, we see that Paul didn't list, list the gifts here as much as he list, listed gifted people that God has placed in the church. Verse 11 reads, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Let's start with apostles. The word means one who is sent with a commission. Jesus had many disciples, but he selected 12 apostles. The disciple or a disciple is a follower or a learner, but an apostle is a divinely appointed representative. The apostles were to give witness of the resurrection and therefore had to have seen the risen Christ personally. These men helped lay the foundation of the church and some were also divinely commissioned to write scripture. Next, Paul mentions the prophets. We commonly associate a prophet with predictions of future events, but this is not their primary function. A New Testament prophet is one who proclaims the word of God. But believers in the New Testament churches, they didn't have Bibles, nor was the New Testament written or completed. So God, through the Holy Spirit, used prophets to make his will known. Then Paul lists evangelists, bearers of the good news. Evangelists traveled from place to place to to preach the gospel and to win the lost to Christ. Of course, they still do that today. 2 Timothy 4.5 says all ministers should do the work of an evangelist. That doesn't mean that all ministers are evangelists. The apostles and prophets laid the foundation of the church, and the evangelists built on it by winning the lost to Christ. In the early church, every believer was a witness, and I believe we should be today as well. But there are certain people who have the actual gift of evangelism. But even without that gifting, we should all have a burden for lost souls and be witnessing to them. Lastly, Paul lists shepherds and teachers. I'm using the English Standard Version Bible today. Other version, versions read pastors and teachers. Pastors are those who, whose God-given ministry gifts and calling lead them to devote themselves to oversee and care for the spiritual needs of a local congregation. They're also called elders and overseers. We're familiar with pastors and their work, but I'll briefly add that a pastor exercises leadership in the local church and are an example of moral purity and sound teaching. The pastor's task is to help believers grow as a body under the head or the headship of Christ and to help develop and equip and prepare them as individuals and as a church to fulfill their God-given roles of Christian service. Teachers are those who have a special God-given gift to clarify, explain, communicate God's word in order to build up the body of Christ. So the gifts of unity that Paul specifically listed in this section, though we discussed a bit more, are apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds and teachers. Moving on to our fourth and final section, 
covering verses 12 to 16, is the growth of unity. Let's read those verses. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is it, which it is equipped when each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Yeah. Paul was looking at the church on two levels in this section. He saw the body of Christ made up of all true believers growing gradually until it reaches spiritual maturity, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But he also saw the local body of believers ministering to each other, growing together, and experiencing spiritual unity. The gifted leaders he listed prior are to equip the saints and work unto the work of ministry, unto the building up the body of Christ. The saints don't call the pastor and pay him to do the work, at least they shouldn't. They call him, follow his leadership as he, through the word, equips them to do the work. The members of the church grow by feeding on the word, ministering to each other. The first evidence of spiritual growth in this section is Christ-likeness. The second evidence is stability. The maturing Christian is not tossed about by every religious novelty that comes along. The unity of faith is experienced, maintained, and perfected by believers accepting and responding to the New Testament faith and message of God-appointed evangelists, pastors, teachers, believing and accepting all of the spiritual resources Christ has made available to help his followers grow in discipline, character, and maturity in all aspects of relationships and service to Christ. And no longer accepting every wind of doctrine, but having knowledge of the truth by which to recognize and reject false teachers. The third evidence of maturity is cooperation. We realize that as members of the one body and a local body, we belong to each other, we need each other, and we affect each other. Each and every believer, bar none, has a ministry to other believers. The body grows as the individual members grow, and they grow as they feed on the word and minister to each other. And note that once again, Paul emphasizes love in our scripture. Verses 15 and 16 read, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Love is the circulatory system of the body of Christ. It is known that isolated, unloved unloved babies, they don't grow properly. They're especially susceptible to disease. On the other hand, babies who are held and loved, they grow normally. They grow stronger. It's the same with the children of God. An isolated Christian cannot minister to others, nor can others minister to them. Everything we've discussed about the unity of the body of Christ halts in that scenario. Meaning, spiritual unity is not something we can manufacture. It's something we already have in Christ, and we must protect it and maintain it in all the ways that Paul has outlined in these 16 verses. To review... We need to be operating with the grace of unity through humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The grounds of unity are foundation. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. The gifts for unity, which Paul lists in this particular scripture as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The growth of unity, Christ-likeness, stability, and cooperation. All of these come together to create spiritual unity in the body of Christ. Spiritual unity in the local body. Spiritual unity in us. And as I said when I began, I am so proud, 
proud in a humble way, of how this church has walked through a pastoral transition, has hit the ground running, has increased its volunteer base, and is currently changing lives and impacting our community for Christ and all for the glory of God. But I don't want us to put it on cruise control now. I don't want us to say, well, we did it. We're okay. We're on the other side. Remember, we each have a role to play, and that role is never complete this side of heaven. We have to keep on keeping on. Each one of us is a vital member of this local body, and we would be incomplete without you. So if you aren't actively serving somewhere, then that means we have plugged that hole with someone else, someone else that cannot fill the role that God designed you for as well. Remember, nobody is a better you than you. We need you. As the title of my message says, let's walk together. But hear me on this. I don't want to walk away and leave anybody behind. I want to walk together. But I want to walk all together. So I'm about to hang a really sharp left right here. Because for this entire message, all 5,325 words so far, I have only addressed the church the Christians, the Christ followers, the saved. I can't leave it at that. We can't risk it. We must be burdened for unsaved souls. And if you are not saved, I just ask that you hear me out. If you are hearing my voice either in person, by live stream or recording, it's because the Holy Spirit has already started beckoning you. How do I know? Because otherwise you wouldn't still be listening. This has not been my greatest, most captivating sermon, to say the least. (laughs) Pastor Bill says some comes by inspiration, some by perspiration. This one was perspiration all the way. But I do know that Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says this. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What does that mean? It means that God's word does not return void. It is never wasted. So I'm going to share some of God's word with you specifically pertaining to salvation. To my youth congregation in the room, my young prayer warriors, y'all are familiar where I'm going with this. So please begin praying for those that need to receive it. We're going to briefly dig into some scriptures on salvation. Why? Because people try to complicate salvation. And that's if you'll start praying. So what is salvation? Salvation is the gift that God gives freely, the gift of eternal life, the opportunity to know and have a personal relationship with God and to be with him forever through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Salvation means deliverance, rescue, bringing safely through or keeping from harm. Why? Why do we need salvation? For that, we're going to go to Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need salvation. We are sinners. The very best person that you know, they are a sinner. I am a sinner. Our leaders are sinners. You all are sinners. The scripture says all have sinned, not just some of us. Not just the worst of us, not those people that you think of. No, all of us are sinners. So in that same vein, we all need salvation. When we are in sin, we are separated from God. God loves us very much, y'all. God loves us so much and he is love. God created us and he wants a relationship with us. But it's a two-way street. We have to want a relationship with him too because God is perfect, literally perfect. He cannot tolerate being in the presence of sin. It just doesn't work. So in our sinful condition, we are separated from God. Our natural tendency is to defy him and go our own way. 
I'm going to give you an example of our natural tendency for defiance. Have you ever wanted to do something? Like you actually wanted to do it until someone told you to do it, and all of a sudden you don't want to do it anymore. You felt that defiance rise up just because someone told you to do that thing. Now you don't want to do what they said just because they are the ones that said it. You would hold out forever not doing the very thing that moments ago you thought was a good idea. That is defiance. That is our sinful human nature. And our natural inclination is to defy God just like that. That's being under the influence of sin. The Bible even uses the words being a slave to sin. So we can see that we're all sinners. We can see that we all need salvation. But we still have that little bit of holdout, that defiance, right? That why can't I do this my own way line of thinking. We're going to move on to our next scripture, Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the wages of sin is death. That's why you just can't do it your own way. The penalty for holding on to that defiance, for living as a slave to sin, is death. And we'll all face physical death one day, assuming God doesn't rapture the church first. And it's true that living in sin and doing foolish things can lead to premature physical death. But this verse is referring to spiritual death. Without salvation, you will be spiritually dead forever separated from God forever listen we as Christians have hope that's what makes us different from the rest of the world our hope is in Christ we know that through him alone we can achieve not just happiness and experience a loving relationship with God here on earth but that when we die we don't have to dread it We can know that we are going to be ushered into the very presence of God in heaven. And not only that, yes. Yes. And not only that, but if our family members are also saved, we'll be reunited with them there as well. But if you're separated from God and you choose to live that way, you will also die that way. Hell is not some fairy tale to get you to live right. I cannot imagine choosing hell. The physical pain would be indescribable. But I don't even think that that's the worst part. Most people think that it is. I don't. To never have hope that I would see the people I love again, ever. I would never feel love again, ever. People think this world is bad, but God through the Holy Spirit is still active and working in this world. There is still the body of Christ, the church working in this world. There are still people who love you, genuinely love you, just because you are you. And God made you in his image in this world. God still tugs at your heart in this world. He speaks to you through his word when you allow him to in this world. Now let's eliminate all of that. Let's take all that away. All the people you love. All the people who love you. Remove the very emotion of love. Take away the actions of love. Eliminate kindness and smiles. Take away all the good people. Take away God's presence. Take it all away. Now add in despair, desperation, incredible, unending pain, gut-wrenching nastiness. That's all that's left. That's what it means to be separated in God, to be spiritually dead or at least as close as I can get with my words, which is in no way adequate. Again, Romans 6, 23 says, for all, I'm sorry, for the wages of sin is death. We've covered that. But the verse keeps going. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now that's the complete opposite of what I just described. Eternal. That's forever and ever and always. Eternal is too long for our human brains to comprehend, really. However long you think eternal is, just keep going. Eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in the presence of Jesus in heaven. Every darkness that I described for hell is no longer. Heaven is light, and it is beauty, and it is peace, and it is love and it is happiness it is all the good in the world and so much more that you can't even imagine because we cannot experience it this side of heaven 
Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. When the verse says he, it's referring to God. No tears in heaven. There's no reason for tears in heaven. There's no reason for tears in heaven. There'll be no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. Only sweet, wonderful goodness. That is the free gift from God. But I feel like right about here, right about at this point, when you're like, maybe Satan rears his ugly head and he says, no, not for you, because you aren't worthy. You can't have this. You aren't worthy of this. And that's when we go to the next verse. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when Satan is trying his best to tell you, you aren't worthy, that maybe salvation is for some, but it isn't for you. You turn to Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We haven't fooled God. We haven't snuck in. We haven't gotten by on a technicality. He knows good and well that we are sinners and do not deserve his gift of salvation. But I told you, he loves us. That much. I know that you can all think of at least one person in your life that you love so much you would sacrifice for. You would pretend that you didn't want something so they could have it. You would spend your money on them instead of yourself. You would give them your time. You would sacrifice your convenience for them. So if you, who are a lowly sinner, can love enough to sacrifice how much more can God who is love show his love for us so when you feel that doubt it's not from God he knows that you don't deserve his gift of salvation none of us do is too great there's nothing that any of us could do to earn it it's free it has to be free otherwise none of us would ever get it because we aren't worthy but God loves us anyway he gives salvation anyway Jesus chose to live as a human experiencing helplessness as a baby and a child He chose to experience the same pain and hunger and loss that we all do in regular life. He wasn't living a life of luxury. He was an ordinary man of the time. Life was very physical back then. Nothing came easy. He chose to endure conflict and heartache and strife. Eventually, he was mocked. The Son of God, all God, and yet also all man. He was mocked by ridiculous, unworthy humans. He was tortured and he was hurt. He was ridiculed and he was spit on. He was beaten and he was berated. He was bloodied and he was laughed at. No living thing should be treated as Jesus was. And he was Jesus. But they didn't believe him. He could have stopped it at any time. He could have called in legions of angels and let us all die and suffer for eternity like we actually deserve. But he didn't. He endured it. He even asked God to forgive the people torturing him moments before he died because they didn't realize what they were doing, who they were torturing and killing. He endured it for us, knowing that we are sinners, knowing that we don't deserve it, and most importantly, knowing that was the only way that we'd ever be able to achieve salvation. He is the only way. The scripture that One Way Student Ministries is based on is John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the one way. To claim the free gift of salvation, you have to know and believe that. Which brings us to our next verse, Romans 10, 9, and 10. This is what it says. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So now we're getting to the action steps of salvation. The scripture says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus and Lord is Jesus is Lord. That means out loud. Don't be ashamed of our Lord and the gospel. Someone around you may still be doubting and your boldness can help them through. 
So you'll say out loud, Jesus is Lord. And don't miss this next part. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You must also believe in your heart. Your words are empty and meaningless without the belief. But in my experience, God starts working on our hearts and our belief before we're bold enough to make the verbal statement out loud. So if you're ready to make the bold statement out loud, you probably already believe. But only you and God know for sure. Check your heart for that belief. The scripture says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. We just discussed that Jesus did die willingly on a cross. He was put in a tomb and as was the burial tradition of the day. And on the third day, he rose again. That wasn't burial tradition of the day. That was a miracle. The Bible describes many eyewitnesses of Jesus after his death and his ascension to heaven. And Jesus is there now preparing a place for us, as we're told in Scripture. So believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then the next part of the verse says, you will be saved. You will be saved. People try to complicate it. They try to make salvation unattainable, but that's not of God. It's not his intentions. He loves you. He wants you to be saved and to spend eternity with him. The last line of the scripture says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That line just repeats what was just stated, but you have to pay attention to things repeated in the Bible. If it's in the Bible once, it's it's the gospel truth. But if it's in there twice, you better sit up and take notice. Believe in your heart and profess or speak it with your mouth that you are saved. But again, it's about time that pesky Satan will pop up. He'll try to tell you, no, that doesn't mean you. That means everybody else. At some point. Satan is called the accuser because he literally accuses us. He knows our sin. He knows our weakness. He knows our fears. And he loves to call them out to us so we begin to believe that that's our identity. So that we think no one could love us, much less sacrifice himself for us. So that's when we turn to the next verse. And it's one of my favorites because I feel like it's a gut punch to the devil and his accusations. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Can y'all say that with me? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So yes, Satan, everyone. But I sinned last week. Yes, you. But I sinned yesterday. Yes, you. But I sinned five minutes ago. Yes, you. To whatever Satan is throwing at you, I say, that may be, but you can still ensure your eternity and live with the hope and reassurance of Jesus because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do y'all get as excited about that as I do? That's our hope. We can be saved. Now, if that one was a gut punch, wait till you hear the next one. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that, Satan? We are in Christ Jesus now. There is no condemnation for us. What does condemnation mean? The act of condemning someone to punishment or sentencing them. You will not be sentencing us today, Satan, or tomorrow or the next day because we are going to confess with our mouth we are going to believe in our heart and we already know we don't deserve it Satan but we serve a mighty God of love and he gave us the free gift of salvation that now we are in Christ Jesus and there is no condemnation for us are y'all with me but Satan doesn't give up easy he's got one more trick up his sleeve one more accusation to hurl ready he'll say What if you mess up? What if you mess it up? So you're good today. You believed it. You spoke it. You're walking in it. But Satan will whisper, what about when you mess it up? Don't listen to him. He's a liar. Let me tell you what happens when you mess up. Romans 8, 38, 39 says, For I am convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you hear that? For I am convinced, it 
says that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Saints, if you will pray. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing, Satan. Nothing. No lies, no missteps, no circumstances. Nothing. God loves you no matter what. We don't deserve it, but that's not how love works. You can't earn it. Now I know, I am very aware that this is not our usual altar call. I realize that. But if there are any here who are unsaved, I'm telling you, yes, it really is that easy. You have heard it straight from the word of God. You have seen the scriptures on the screens. The Holy Spirit has already started doing his work. Now I'm asking you to please come down to this altar and claim what Jesus has already paid for. We want to walk together. But we want to walk all together. We don't want to leave you behind. So if there was anyone here, anyone who was unsaved, come now. There will be nobody here judging you. It is just the opposite. We have been where you are. I remember that day very vividly. We have been where you are, and we want to celebrate with you. If there are any here that need to come to this altar and claim that gift of salvation, come now. This altar is open people will meet you here and pray with you. We will celebrate with you. We're going to give it a moment. If you are at home, if you're listening by live stream, if you're listening by recording, this is all applicable to you too. You can have your altar moment right where you're at. Wherever you are, you drop down to your knees. You lift your hands to the heavens. You talk to God. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've strayed from the Lord and you need to come down here and recommit your life to him, now's the time. We're going to do this thing together. We're going to walk together. If that's you, come down. Please don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't let him whisper accusations in your ear. There's nobody else. It's just you. They'll be judging you. No, they won't. We're just as human as you are, friend. We are just as human as you are, and we've made that same walk. Again, if you are at home, wherever you may be, if you're listening, it's applicable to you too. Pull over if you're in the car. Drop to your knees if you can. Recommit your life to the Lord. church, the Apostle Paul laid out how we can have spiritual unity in the body of Christ. I believe that as long as we are faithful to the things of God and walking according to his will, he'll use this church, but we're going to need to walk together. So I'm going to ask you to please come to the altar together in unity and join me in praying for our church that we will be attentive to his call and direction as he walks with us through this season and beyond to the great things that he has in store. Let's walk together, church. The altar is open.
How many of you know our youth department's in good hands? Amen. Wow. What a word from God. What a word from the Lord. Thank you, Sister Jenna. And she started through those four points of unity, and I'm not going to re-preach them. Somebody say amen. I might. <laughs> the thing that came to my mind was this. How in the world can God take the diversity of people with a past that everybody knows about? Everybody knows about how can God take the diversity of people that everybody in this room knows the past of everybody in this room. And I think she covered that when she told us and the scripture told us we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But somehow through the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, he brings us all together under one umbrella, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are saved and we are set free and we show a community that lost people who once were lost that now are saved can show them the same same love and they can receive eternal life that is the love of Jesus Christ somebody say amen <laughs> Woo! got me wanting to preach <laughs> how does somebody take how does God take 21 years ago and let's don't make no bones about it. Who's your pastor? <laughs> and so let's don't pretend here. How does he take an addict and set him free, fill him with the power of God, call him into the ministry, bring him back to a community where he reached so much havoc and so much, oh, he's just a good old boy. No, 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 no. I was way past a good old boy. I was a sinner and a hellion, and Jesus set me free. Somebody say amen. <laughs> amen. How does God do that? The same way he's called every one of you with a gift inside of each one of you to be unified in this body of Christ. God ordained. I got to stop. <laughs> God ordained every person in this building and in this church to be a part of this body to show everybody else Jesus is real. Amen? And that his delivering power is real. There's some of you that were raised in church, have known God all your life, and you're not living for him. The Holy Spirit is saying, hey, Come back to me. Everybody knows you, Pastor. You might as well just come on. Join the rest of us. <laughs> right? The thing, here's the beauty about it, and we're gonna we're gonna pray and dismiss. Everybody believe that? Yeah. Most of you don't. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of it is this. People may not forget your past. They also will not forget what Jesus has done for you and your future. Amen. They won't forget it. When it's real, they won't forget it. They'll talk about it in the streets. <laughs> Can you believe so-and-so's up there at that church? Yeah. Come on and join so-and-so up here at this church. She said we're just lost people found by God, walking together in unity for the beauty of the kingdom of God. How many of you glad you came to church today? Amen. She said it. If you ain't volunteering, she said it. <laughs> she showed you. <laughs> Get involved in your local body of believers. There's plenty for you to do. Amen. If you can't find some, come see me. I promise you I'll put you to work. I'm thankful for the administration skills that people have to help me as a pastor. The responsibility of the pastor is this, feed the sheep for the working of the ministry. That's my responsibility. And when you got people up under you that undergird you 
and have administrative skills and have the ability to do things that you possibly may not be able to do. You bring them alongside of you. You're not looking for accolades. It doesn't matter who gets the attaboys. What matters is King Jesus is lifted up. And he said, where I am lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So just come join us. Golly. Man, this is good. <laughs> I may preach this next week. <laughs> Come back next week and be with us if you can. We'd love to have you back. Let's give Sister Jenna a big hand this morning. Can we do that? Thank you for giving me. Thank you for giving me a break. I appreciate that so much. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed the sermon. We'd love to see you in person. We're at 2062 River Road in Sneeds, Florida, 32460. On Sundays, our Sunday school begins at 9 a.m. and our Sunday morning service begins at 10 a.m. Hope to see you soon.